How's everybody this evening? It's a blessing to have you here. It's a blessing to have Chris, Father Chris Alar with us. As many of you know, you're probably here because you've seen him on EWTN or you've seen him on YouTube or on the divinemercy.org site because he is a blessing to the world. He's going to be a blessing to us over these next two days. This is a prayerful place. This is a place of of entering into a deeper relationship with God through the mercy that comes to us through His Son. So let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we are so thankful for this day that You have given us. We're thankful for the many blessings You have already given to each of us today. We also are mindful of those who may not feel blessed in this moment, those who are in conflict, those who are hungry, those who may be cold or not have a place to sleep. Lord, as we gather and as we, your sons and daughters, come together as the body of Christ, any prayer that we have, any hope that we have, any love that we have, share with those in need this evening as we come together and celebrate your son's mercy. And in the words that Jesus taught us, let's all share together our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please join me in welcoming Father Chris Alar? God bless you. Well, thank you, everybody. God bless you for taking the time to come with us this evening. Um, The timing is really good, and thank you so much, Father, for allowing me to come. The timing is perfect um, because we are celebrating right now in our church um, the approach, or I should say preparing, for Divine Mercy Sunday. And and can everybody hear me okay in the back? Okay. Um, So we're preparing for Divine Mercy Sunday, which is the Sunday after Easter. And the way the world is going, we have to ask the question, will we even get through another Divine Mercy Sunday after this one? I'm convinced We will get through this Divine Mercy Sunday before Christ comes again. But I don't know about the second one. So all the signs are are there. All the scriptural um, uh, prophecy is there. I do entire talks. You can find them on YouTube, on the Catholic View of End Times, what the scripture says. All of this is happening. Now, we don't know the day or the time. We have no idea. But we do know that all of this is being fulfilled So what is critically important right now and why God has you in this seat is so that we are prepared because we don't know when he'll come, but now is the perfect time to prepare. So the goal of these next two nights is going to have you walk out of here that you know exactly what mercy is exactly what to do to receive the grace. I've added some new things that uh, I've not talked about before. Um, So hopefully you'll get something out of this and we really hope and pray that you will open the heart to receive God's message of mercy. And uh, we're very grateful. Um, We're also excited because God's been doing a lot to get mercy out there. Another reason I think uh, that we have to listen because You know, Jesus said, now is the time of mercy. He said, uh, please follow it now because after it will come the time of justice. And we're not going to make it through the time of justice. We got to do this now. And we have, Pope Francis said that while the mercy of God is infinite, the time of mercy is not. And he said, we have a closing window. Right now, the window that's been wide open is closing. And, and Jesus even said, after the time of mercy is coming the time of justice. And so now is the time for us to get this grace. 
Jesus said mercy is mankind's last hope of salvation. He said, if you don't pass through the doors of my mercy, you must pass through the doors of my justice. So again, tonight, we are hoping you'll stay and open your heart. Um, I'm, this is one of the last parish missions I'll be doing. And so God has me here for a reason. Um, I'll be taking a time, a leave of absence to care for my, my mother. I don't know how long that'll take, but this will be the, one of the few remaining ones for a while. I will do a couple of conferences. I'm doing a pilgrimage uh, to the, uh, uh, the Mediterranean, the footsteps of St. Paul. If you want to join us, I can give you that information into the shrines of France. And after that, that's about it for me. Uh, but we will continue our EWTN show. We hope that you've tuned in. Has anybody here seen the EWTN Living Divine Mercy show? As some of you, please spread the word because um, this is a show that we do. It's every Wednesday night at 5.30 on EWTN. Um, we got some amazing guests coming up. Uh, next week, I'm interviewing Mark Wahlberg. Um, I'm driving out to Boston to sit down with him. That show will air later in April. Uh, we'll be talking to him about his new movie called Father Stu, about the priesthood. Um, I just finished an interview with Coach Lou Holtz. Do we have any Notre Dame fans here? Okay. <laughs> Um, I couldn't get Bo Schembechler, God rest his soul, he's passed away, being a Michigan graduate. Um, but uh, anyway, we are really excited about some of the guests. We even have some really strange ones you wouldn't think. Ted Nugent, the rock star. Believe it or not, Ted Nugent said, the only high you ever need, and he has never been drunk and never done drugs. Ted Nugent, you'd think that's crazy. Gene Simmons from KISS. And Ted Nugent, of all people, two of the biggest rock stars of the 70s, never drunk, never, never high. And Ted Nugent said, the only high I need is bow hunting for deer and God's creation in universe. So we're going to have him on on the 4th of July uh, talking about religious freedom. Uh, we've got, uh, does anybody here know who Elvis's first on-screen kiss was? It was a lady by the name of Dolores Hart. And Elvis, her first kiss was Dolores Hart. Now, I don't know what this says, but right after it, she ran into the convent. <laughs> she became a nun. She was an aspiring actress in Hollywood. And she became a nun. And she's 88 years old. And I just talked to her the other day. I'm driving to Connecticut. She's still in the convent. And so we're going to be interviewing her. So we're super, super excited about that. Um, and pray for us. We have a real in uh, to a, the wife and a real personal close friend of Sylvester Stallone. And so we didn't know he was a really active Catholic. Uh, so we are trying to get him on the show as well. So please tune in on Wednesdays, 5.30 out here at 6.30 Eastern Time. So praise be to God for divine mercy. So what are we going to do tonight? All right, the first talk, uh, we, our goal is to get you out of here in 90 minutes. So we're going to do a 40-minute talk, take a 10-minute break, and another 40-minute talk, okay? So if you need to stretch and you get up or you need to use the bathroom, please go. But that's our goal. And so praise be to God that you're here. You're here for a reason. God put you in this seat. And for those watching us at home, same thing. We are having to listen to this message of mercy. I can't emphasize it enough. When God says it's mankind's last hope of salvation, we need to listen. So we are all ready to tell you now what you need to do to get this special grace of Divine Mercy Sunday. Okay, so let's start with the Marians. Now that's a picture of the shrine there on your screen. I don't know if you can see it too well. It looks really nice in the picture, but it's falling apart. Leaks and rotted wood and whatnot. Uh, the church is entrusted, I'm part of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. We are a religious community entrusted with the message of divine mercy. So whenever you see this image, this image that Father has um, right there on the church, or if you have at your home, please get this image. We're going to talk about this tomorrow in detail, the full meaning of it. This is our image. We restored it, and we uh, worked with the sisters in Poland, and we Marian fathers are the ones who published the diary. The diary of St. Faustina 
is uh, published by Marion Press, and I am the head of Marion Press as the director of the Association of Marion Helpers in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. So if you ever make it to the shrine, and I think I have a pointer here. Yeah, there we go. Uh, if you ever make it to the shrine, come by and say hello, okay? Now, we Marians are the ones who brought divine mercy to the world through one of our priests in a miraculous journey with canceled paperwork in the middle of World War II. That journey itself could be an entire talk, but we can't do that tonight. We'll just tell you that it got here in a miracle. So tonight on the first talk, I'm going to tell you what mercy is and tell you the meaning of the mass. In the second part of the talk tonight, I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit more about the definition of mercy and about St. Faustina. Then we'll end it tonight and then come back tomorrow because please, tomorrow is the biggie. We're going to tell you all about the Feast of Divine Mercy, the image of Divine Mercy, the novena, the chaplet, and the hour, and we've added some new things, so we hope you'll be with us. All right. To understand Divine Mercy, we have to first understand, if I can get my thing working here, okay, who is Jesus to you? Now, this seems like an obvious question, right? And all us Marians are asked this, you've been asked it, by your children, who is Jesus to you? Now, obviously answers will vary. Um, some people think he's Santa Claus, right? Lord, I need this, I need this, I need this. No, that's not necessarily who Jesus is. Now, here's the thing though. Most all of us can agree he is God, right? Or we wouldn't be here, all right? So answers will vary, but most agree he is God. And we all wanna be like him. That is the key goal for you, how you will be judged. You will be judged entirely by love and how much people saw Jesus when they saw you. When you wake up in the morning and you go downstairs, does everybody have that beautiful feeling, Jesus has just entered the room? <laughs> Probably not. And if not, we got some work to do. So what we have to do is imitate Christ more and more. And how do we do that? There's one key. It's called virtue. Virtue. We need to have virtue. Now, there's all kinds of virtues. There's prudence and temperance and fortitude and justice. But the three big ones, you all know these, the three big virtues, and if I can't get this to work here, let's try this again. All right. The three big virtues are the theological virtues. Now, theo, why do they call these the theological virtues? Because theos means God. Theology, the study of God. Theos. So theology or theological virtues means from God. You do not get these virtues by practice. Like you can get the virtue of patience through practice. You can get the virtue of temperance through practice. But you can't practice these. These are a gift from God, guess when? At your baptism. This is why I personally believe the world is in a mess. Because we're not baptizing our children anymore. So many Catholics, priests used to tell me at the parishes, they used to have hundreds of baptisms a year. Now they three or four. Really? Boy, if you do nothing else, get your children and grandchildren baptized. It's in the baptism that they get these three virtues. Without baptism, we don't have these three virtues. These are the three virtues given by God at baptism, and they are faith, hope, and the greatest of these is love. All right, so God is love. So we go back here, we say to ourselves, and this is important, what one word then, if the greatest of these is love, what one word describes God? The best word that describes God is, boy, I'm having a tough time with this. God is love. Now, to answer our question, who is Jesus? Jesus is God. And God is love. So Jesus is love. Now, is all love the same? This is what confuses people. Not all love is the same. I always use that example. Do I love, I used to say Michigan football. Now I'm saying Michigan basketball. <laughs> Do I love Michigan basketball as much as uh, Father, you know, Father John up in my religious community? No. It's a different kind of love. 
Now, if Michigan wins the national championship, then maybe that love will go up a notch. But the point, <laughs> the point is not all love is the same. The Greeks tell us we have three forms of love, right? Eros, that's where erotic comes from. That's physical love. Then you have filial love, like a brotherhood. I love you like a brother. I have filial love for, you know, a, a good friend, like a brother. But the highest form of love is agape love, is agape love. That's the highest form, complete surrender. And when you put that love into action, when you put that love into action, you have mercy. You want to know what mercy is? Mercy is the highest form, is the highest form of the highest virtue. We just said all the virtues, love is the highest, but of all the forms of love, mercy is the highest. In other words, it's the greatest mode of love, mercy. It's the highest form of the highest virtue. You can't do better. So what is mercy? Mercy is a particular mode of love, the highest mode that when love encounters suffering, it takes action to do something about it. It's just not sitting back and watching it. You know, I had a woman from Connecticut and she was telling me about her husband and she said, you know, he never went to church. And he said, I don't need to go to church. God knows I love him. And she would go to church on and on and he would say, she would invite him and she would say, come on, honey, come with me. He'd be like, no, 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 God doesn't need, he knows I love him. And she'd say, come on, honey, please come visit with me. I'm going to adoration. God wants you to visit him, just like any friend. And he would be like, nah, nah. Well, anyway, they came to visit me one day, and she's elbowing him, saying, tell him, Harold, what, what happened? So anyway, Harold one day went in for um, an orthoscopic knee procedure. It was supposed to be a day, you know, inpatient or outpatient thing. And there were some complications, and he got a bad infection. And uh, there was some, something happened, ended up being later a bad infection, but they kept him at the hospital and he couldn't drive home. And so he calls his wife up and he says, you know, they admitted me. And um, when are you going to come see me? And she says, is it serious? And he's like, well, no, it's not life threatening. And she says, oh, and he goes, well, when are you coming to see me? You see where I'm going with this? And she says, well, honey, I got a lot of errands to run. I got to get Jake from soccer practice. I got to stop by the grocery store. I have to make the cake for the uh, bingo thing tomorrow. I got a lot of errands to run. I'm super, super busy. You understand. I can't make it. He's like, what? And right then he goes, don't you love me? And he's like, ah. He, he realized right then and there because he expected her, if she loved him, to come be with him, to come visit, to put that love into action. I could tell you all day long I love you, but you call me at 2 o'clock in the morning because you have a flat tire in a bad section of town, and I say, you know what, I'm really tired right now. Sorry. That's not putting love into action. Now, I can still love you. So love is still there. But it's not until I put that love into action that it becomes a higher form. And then when that love is put into action because of your suffering, it's the highest of all high forms. So what is mercy? Mercy is a particular mode of love that when love encounters suffering, it takes action to do something about it. As Father Kosicki used to say, I don't know if you could read it, but but mercy is having pains in your heart for the pains of another and taking pains to do something about their pain. And as I always say, that's a lot of pain. <laughs> now, Father Seraphim used to define it, God rest his soul, is mercy is loving the unlovable and forgiving the unforgivable. Now that's interesting. Loving the unlovable and forgiving the unforgivable. Why? I love this picture. Can you see it? We are all suffering. We are all that guy right there. And God wants to do something about it. Look at Jesus there. Now, 
This guy is unlovable and unforgivable. I don't know if you can see it, but can you see what's on his hand? That's a hammer. That's a nail. He's got the hammer and the nail, which is what you do every single time we choose sin. Do you know that God is outside of time? So every time you choose to sin, we drive a deeper nail into Christ at the time of the crucifixion. Do you know Jesus told St. Faustina that it was her prayers that got her through the, him, it was her prayers that got him through the agony in the garden. Now that's amazing because she lived 1900 years after Jesus. So every prayer she made consoled him at the moment of his passion. Because he saw every sin, past, present, or future. But he also saw every prayer, past, present, and future. So do you know, tonight, you can go home and you can lift the weight off of Jesus' cross by being Christ-like to your spouse and your children and loving and doing your prayers. Or you can jump on top of that cross and stomp on it. And make it even heavier by going and visiting wrong websites or chewing out somebody or sending an, a, a, a mad email. Right now, every single action we choose either lifts the cross of Christ or heavies it, makes it more heavy to him. 2,000 years ago. This is an incredible concept. Be a lifter, not a pusher. And so this is what we don't understand about how powerful it is. So we are suffering. God wants to do something about it. This guy's unlovable. He's unforgivable. And when God steps in, when Jesus steps in to love the unlovable or forgive the unforgivable, it becomes divine mercy. So mercy is loving the unlovable, forgiving the unforgivable. When God does it, it becomes divine mercy. That's what divine mercy is. Now, we're going to continue here. Here's a picture of the shrine. This is our shrine of divine mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Now, we are suffering. So what does God do? What is his act of love that becomes mercy? Mercy is putting love into action when it encounters suffering. So what does God do when he sees our suffering? Believe it or not, he gives us the church. He gives us religion. Why? Because we need grace. And it is through the sacraments. You know, everybody always says, oh, and my mom and dad used to say this, oh, oh, oh. It doesn't matter what you are as long as you're something. Not a true, no, no, no. What makes our faith different than all 40,000 other faiths, and let's even go beyond the 40,000, let's go to non-Christian, what makes our faith different than non-Christians, like Islam and others, is because Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way. Now, what about Christians? Well, my, my brother is Baptist or Methodist or something, and that's just as good. No, because they don't have the sacraments. Now, that doesn't mean I am criticizing them. I'm not. But you have been given the fullness of the truth and the fullness of grace in the sacraments. Don't let them slip away. So grace is guaranteed in the sacraments. You're not hoping that you get grace. You're guaranteed it. Now, here's the thing. Everybody always says, Father, I'm not into organized religion. I'm spiritual. I'm not religious. I'm not into organized religion. Now, nicely as I can, you know what I always say? That's too bad. Because Jesus organized religion. Jesus organized religion. He established the College of Bishops in the Apostles. He established the Magisterium and gave them the authority to declare truth in his name, to heal and administer grace in his name. He set up the chair of the papacy and placed Peter upon it and established the hierarchy by which apostolic succession has continued from Peter right to us today. 
Do you know that the Catholic Church is the only church in the world, the only faith? And I'll point out to Father John. When Father John was ordained by the bishop, the bishop laid hands on Father John. And when that bishop was ordained a priest, some bishop laid hands on him. And when that priest was ordained a bishop, or ordained a priest, or when that bishop was ordained a priest, some bishop laid hands on him. Same with me. Every living priest has been, from absolute laying of physical hands, we can be traced back to one of the twelve apostles. It's called apostolic succession. No other faith in the world has this. The Orthodox do, but I did a talk on that, but they're not in communion with Rome. The power of that means you are guaranteed an, an, a successive line all the way from the apostles. Now, does that mean that the priest is going to be perfect, that we haven't had stupidity and idiotic, idiotic actions? Of course we have. But I'll tell you this. Jesus, in his own inner circle, had Judas. Right? And you don't leave Jesus because of Judas. Do you know this? I'm not going to get into the scandal right now. If there's any here that are abuse victims, God bless you. I pray for you. There's no excuse ever, ever. But the media wants you to think it's just a Catholic problem. The point is, it's not just a Catholic problem. It's a broken humanity problem. Do you know where 85% of abuse happens? Anybody? In the home. You know the next highest, 14%, you know where that happens? Schools and extracurricular activities. 1% happens in religious institutions, and that's way too much. It should be zero. And of that 1%, the Catholic Church is in the bottom half. Don't believe me? Look up the John Jay report. Look up the Jenkins study from Penn State. I'll tell you all about it. I'm not here to discuss that. But I'm just trying to tell you, it's a broken humanity problem. Now, that doesn't excuse it. One case, one priest is too many and not allowed. But please don't leave Jesus because of Judas. Now, we need religion. We are suffering. And God gives us religion. We need religion to help us find God, to heal. And we do that in the sacraments. All right? The sacraments give us actual grace. Do you know for 1,500 years, there was only the Catholic Church? Everybody who always writes to me and scolds us that the Catholic Church is not of the Bible, do you know where the Bible came from? Yes. People will say, God, ultimately it was God, of course. But I ask you this, back in the first two centuries, there was all kinds of Gospels. There were the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of course, but there was the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Ma uh, uh, P uh, Mary. Now, that does not mean that Mary wrote it, or that Peter wrote it, or that Thomas wrote it. They just took the name. And do you know that each one of those, each one of those, who picked who went into the Bible? Who picked Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to go into the Bible? And why not Thomas and the Gospel of Peter and the Gospel of Mar Mary? Why? Because it was the church that determined through the authority given to her by God which books were inspired. So when anybody criticizes the church and says, stick to your Bible, you could say, oh, sorry, hold on. Do you mean that Bible that you're holding? Yes. Well, that came from the Catholic Church. So you can't accept that Bible and reject the authority from which it came. What are you talking about, Father Chris? It came from the councils of Carthage and Hippo in 393 and 397 AD. This is what we have in our faith. Now, people always say, well, your faith is just like anybody else's, or it's decrepit, or all this and that. Yeah, we have mistakes. But, you know, it's funny because I lived in Michigan. Um, I lived in Utah. I lived in North Carolina. So when I was in Utah, all our neighbors were Mormon. They were beautiful people. But who started the Mormon religion? John Smith, right, in 1609. I lived in Michigan. I lived in North Carolina. North Carolina, they were all my neighbors were Baptist. Who started the Baptist religion? 
Joseph Smith in 1830. No, that was Mormons, I'm sorry. Uh, John Smith was the Baptist in 1609, and Joe Smith, Joseph Smith was Mormons in 1830. You get the point. Then I lived in Michigan. All my neighbors were Episcopalian. God bless them, good people. But who started their church? Samuel Seabury in 1789. You get my point. The point is, I can point to every religion, every Christian religion, all 40,000. And you know there's a website that does this? There's a website that lists all 40,000. It's like, who started your religion.com or something like that? And it has all the religions. All the Lutheran and, and Methodist and Mennonite and all these. And it says, who started it and when? What do you think it says for Catholicism? Who started it? Jesus Christ at the Last Supper. So these are things that we don't know about our faith. All right, so now, what does it matter? Okay, it does matter. It does matter what religion you are. Why? Well, first of all, let's start with Christianity. We are the only ones who believe in the Trinity. Do you know I can prove to you right now that God has to be a Trinity? I'm just going to borrow from St. Augustine. But I can prove to you right now God has to be a Trinity. He cannot be anything else. All right. What one word did we say describes God? Love. Okay. If I'm the only person who ever existed, none of you ever existed, I'm the only one. Nobody else on this earth ever existed, just me. Can there be love? No. Oh, come on, mixed bag. No, because in order to have love, you need a community of persons. You need a lover. You need the beloved. And you need the love between them. Now, what's really interesting, God has to be a trinity. And this is a picture from our shrine. Here's why. Love needs a community of persons. In order to have God, you need love. God is love. In order to have love, you can't just have one person. I have nobody to love and nobody to love me back. You know what the Trinity is? The Trinity is the lover, God the Father, the beloved, God the Son. And the love between them is so great that from it comes a third person, the Holy Spirit. Do you know that's all the Trinity is? The Trinity is simply the love between the Father and the Son. The love between the Father and the Son is so great that it becomes a third person. Now, what is this? The family is a mirror of the Trinity. You have the Father, the lover. The husband, the lover. You have the wife, the beloved. And the love between them is so great that from it comes a third person, the child. The power of love is so great that it can become a person. Now, the Holy Spirit wasn't created. All of that happened simultaneously. But love flows outside of itself, outside of the woman to the husband, outside the husband to the wife, and the two become together, and from it comes a third person. This is a mirror of the Trinity. This is why marriage has to be between a man and a woman. Yes, I can love another man. I love Father Don Calloway, but I can guarantee you it ain't that kind of love. <laughs> Plus, it couldn't be if I wanted it. Okay? This is a mirror of the Trinity. Love flows outside of itself. It's the same with God. Love flowed outside of God and gave us creation. Love of, of the Trinity overflowed outside of itself. And what time did I start? 6.30? Okay. I'm already running behind. All right. Now, our whole faith, some of you may have heard me do this a little bit in a talk before, but I think it's so important right now that we, we rehash this because I haven't talked about this in two years. I did before, but I haven't talked about this in two years, and I think it's so important that we have to. Our whole faith, I'm going to give you four years of seminary in four minutes. Four years of seminary in four minutes. Our entire faith can be summarized by a circle, according to Thomas Aquinas. 
All right? All comes from God. All will return to God. That is the whole concept of the mass, the faith, everything. All comes from God. All will return to God. This is incredible. Now, what do I mean? All right. God's three great act of mercy. The first and great act of mercy was and is creation. All right, creation. Now, creation is mercy. Because the greatest evil, believe it or not, is not murder or adultery. You know what the greatest evil is? Not to exist. A lack. And so the greatest misery is not to exist. So when God created, out of love, he brought us into existence. Now, what's happened is we've gotten broken. We've removed God. We've pulled God out. We've pulled God out of our schools. We've pulled God out of our families, out of our businesses, out of our courts, out of everywhere. And when you have that, guess what you have? You have a lack of the good because God is good. He is love. He is good. You pull God out or you pull God out of a school and what's left is a privation of the good. That is the definition of evil. Now, oops, I had it. There we go. This is a school shooting, one of many. And I say, does evil exist as a real thing? No, it doesn't. Because that would mean God created it. Well, Father, what do you mean evil isn't real? No, evil is actually a lack of something. It's a lack of the good, a privation of the good. You know, I saw a t-shirt, I've said this one way back in old talks, but I saw a lady years ago in the airport, and she had a shirt on that said, Columbine. Sandy Hook. You know, those are the school shootings. And it said, God, how can you let this happen in our schools? And then it said below it, God, quote, I'm not allowed in your schools. That's what's going on. So evil came into the world. So the first great act of mercy, who do we normally attribute the first great act of mercy to? Father, Son, or Holy Spirit? The Father, the first great act of mercy by the first person of the Trinity, creation. Then what happened? We pulled God out. We got broken. So what's God's answer? His answer is the second greatest act of mercy, redemption. The repair man. Now who came down and redeemed us? The second person of the Trinity, Jesus. It makes sense. So the second great act of mercy is redemption by the second person of the Trinity, Jesus. Now, all mankind is redeemed, but will all mankind be saved? No. We need to be made holy. So in the third and final and greatest act of mercy, sanctification. Now, this is where we finish the first part of the talk. Where do we see this? Where do we see these three great acts of God's mercy? Creation, redemption, and sanctification. Well, let's look at sanctification. Where do we see this? Some people will say at your baptism. Yes, that's a start. But when you're baptized, you're not ready for heaven necessarily, especially if you grow older. What about when you die and you go before the God, uh, the Father, you see, behold the beatific vision, are you sanctified then? Yes, if you've been purified beforehand. Otherwise, you'll spend some time in purgatory. So where does this happen? Where does this happen every day, somewhere around the world, at every minute of every day? It happens right here at the Mass. This is St. Albertus in downtown Detroit. Now we have Justina here, the Polish lady. She makes a lot of things happen here, doesn't she? This is a Polish church in downtown Detroit. You want to see some of the greatest and most beautiful churches in the world that rival Europe? Go to downtown Detroit. Sweetest Heart of Mary, St. Jehoshaphat, St. Albertus. These are the most incredible churches you will ever see. Downtown Detroit. This is St. Albertus. Now, this is when it happens. When does this sanctification happen? When? Where? How? All right, we're going to finish this talk in, in, in just a couple minutes, this first part. Because I said the first great act of mercy, let's go back to our circle here. 
First great of act of mercy by the first person of the Trinity, creation, all comes from God. All of creation is present at the Mass, even if you're not in the pew. Because God is ever present, God is all and everywhere. So, first great act of mercy from the first person of the Trinity, creation. All of creation is here at the Mass. Now, guess what happens? We got broken. So in the second act of mercy, the second person of the Trinity came down and redeemed us. By what act? Dying on the cross. That is why you see at every Catholic church a crucifix. A crucifix. This is because Jesus had to die to pay what is the penalty for sin. We're going to talk about that in the next talk. Why did Jesus die on the cross? We're going to talk about that in the next talk after the break. But we know at the Mass, you are here. You are here as Jesus is paying your debt, as he's redeeming you. We are at Calvary. So in the second great act of mercy, we're going to talk about it more in the next half, is redemption. So, first great act of mercy, creation. We got broken. In the second great act of mercy, Jesus, uh, God sent his son. He redeemed us. Now, in the third and the final and the greatest act of mercy, guess who? The Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity will take us back to God the Father from which we came. This is called sanctification. This is what we have in the Mass. This is everything Paul tells us. You want to be in the Bible? You want to follow the Bible? Paul tells you everything. Divinization, they call it in the East. It means that you will become and share in the inner trinity of God. You don't become a member of the trinity, but you share in the divine life of God. And where do you do it? Right here. So this is where I want to finish the first talk. This is the Mass. So when you are at the Mass, this is what's happening. God is finishing the cycle. He created us. We got broken. Jesus fixed us. Now he's redeemed us. Now he puts us on his shoulders. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he takes us back from where we came, back to God the Father. This is our whole faith summarized. All comes from God. All will return to God. Exitus reditus. This is what happens at the Mass. Well, Father, where does it happen at the Mass? Okay. Creation is all present. We said that. Two, redemption. We're here at Calvary as Jesus is paying his debt to, to sin. And we'll explain that next talk if you're not understanding that. But in the third and final and greatest act of mercy, the Holy Spirit returns us back to God the Father so we can be with him forever and share in divine life. When does that happen in the Mass? Where in the Mass does that happen? What's the greatest high point of the Mass? Everybody says consecration. I actually agree with Father Mike Gately here. And many great theologians. Actually, the greatest part of the Mass, consecration is leading up to it. You can't have it without consecration. But you know the greatest part of the Mass? It's called the concluding doxology. You know what that is? What's the concluding doxology? All the Mass reaches its high point when that priest who is in persona Christi, that's why he has to be a man, the church is not sexist. In fact, I always say what's a higher calling, no offense to Father John, but what's a higher calling? A diocesan priest or a cloistered nun? A cloistered nun. Cloistered nun's a higher calling in the way of life. Now, that doesn't mean that she can do the sacraments, but... The church isn't sexist. It's like two genders. You, you're equal but different. Please don't fall for this Ugh, transgender stuff. So, in the church, the priest who is in persona Christi is in the person of Christ. When he resurrected, he redeemed humanity. And now by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's why in the creed we say by the power of the Holy Spirit, he returns us back to God the Father. How does he do that? He takes us back to God the Father because that's where we belong. Now through the power of the Holy Spirit. So what's happening? The priest takes that patent, takes that chalice, lifts it, 
and says, through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father. Who are the prayers of the Mass addressed to? It's not Jesus. The prayers of the Mass are addressed to who? The Father. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father. In the unity of the Holy Spirit. So you got all three here. The priest is Jesus offering the sacrifice. God the Father is to whom it's going. Through the power of the Holy Spirit is the avenue by which it happens. Through him and with him and in him. O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. I bet you're sleeping, you're looking at your watch, and I'm not criticizing you because I did it too. Until I went to seminary and learned what is actually happening at the Mass, I learned this in seminary. I'm sitting there going, why isn't every priest in the world jumping up and down, screaming from the rooftops, this is what's happening in the Mass? What's happening in the Mass is that the Holy Spirit is taking us back to God the Father. We're sanctified. We've been redeemed by Jesus. We've been created by the Father, the first act, first person. We've been redeemed by Jesus, the second act, the second person. We've now been sanctified and brought back to God the Father, the third act, the mercy by the third person of the Trinity. Through Him, with Him, in Him. And all of a sudden we're coming back to God the Father. Now all of a sudden we are saved. That's what sanctification means. We are saved. None of that suffices for saying, I profess Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Well, that's great. But until you have the active work of the Trinity actually pouring that grace out and returning you back to God the Father, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. And so we have this, this priest is the man who's in the person despite his weakness and sinfulness. Now at the Mass it's so powerful because at the Mass is, this is happening. Do you know all your guardian angels come forward? Do you know all your guardian angels kneel around the altar at that moment of elevation? And guess what they're doing? They're holding vessels. The mystics all tell us this. The mystics all see this. You know, I had this one young man at the shrine. And I, I walked up to beginning and to, to, to celebrate Mass, and he was so incorrigible, and I, I didn't know his background. And he was yelling and screaming. And you know who I think are the greatest people in the world? Special needs parents. I, I, I just, I, I can't say enough because God only gives you what you can carry, and, and he never would have given that to me because I'm not capable I don't have the patience and, and I, I get too frustrated and I pray God every day to help me with that struggle. And so this woman is holding on to this young boy and he's flailing and he's screaming and I'm trying to go up and, and I'm walking up the aisle thinking, oh my, you know, Lord, I, I hope we can do this Mass. I mean, it was really screaming and she was flailing. So I began the Mass in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he completely stopped. And all of a sudden, he just stared like this, the whole Mass. And then at the consecration, his eyes went down to the altar. And I'm, 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 I'm consecrating the host, and I'm, I'm doing the Mass. He doesn't peep. And I walk out to the back of the Mass, and soon as the music stopped and it ended, he started screaming and flailing and yelling and foaming at the mouth. And his mother, God bless her, she's holding on to him. And she walks to the back with him. And I said, he was so beautiful during the Mass. And she says, oh, Father, he sees angels. He couldn't talk. The only words that he's ever uttered to her is, I see angels. And all the mystics tell us, in the Mass, your, your guardian angels come forward and they kneel around the altar and they're holding vessels. And guess what's in those vessels? What you put into it. So when the priest elevates that patent and that host and he offers it, he offers it to God the Father, put all of your intentions on that patent. Every dream, sorrow, hope, joy, suffering. Put it on that patent to be purified, to be sanctified. 
And so when you elevate that, you put everything on that patent and you offer it back to God the Father. We don't do that and we wonder why we feel so dry. And your angels, they carry forward, guess what they carry forward? In the vessel, what you put into it. If you truly come to Mass and you give your heart and your prayer and you believe, the angel, your guardian angel, will take that in a golden vessel up to this altar to place it on the paten at the time of the Mass. The mystics all tell us this. And so don't make your guardian angel the sad guardian angel <laughs> with nothing in his vessel. Put everything in there. Faith, hope, dreams, everything. And then... It's consummated. After that host is, is, is consecrated and it's offered back to God the Father, there's another epiclesis. And all of a sudden you are sanctified. And all of a sudden now, guess what happens? The wedding. It's a wedding. The whole mass. is a, The book of Revelation is not about the Antichrist. The book of Revelation is not about the rapture. The rapture was made up by an 18th century, 19th century girl in the, U, in the in United Kingdom. People will argue that it's in there. The two people were at the mill and one disappeared and one was left. Scott Hahn says it's the opposite. It's like Noah. The good were left. The bad were taken. Not the good were taken. The bad were left. The book of Revelation is about the mass. And in that book of the mass, it's a wedding feast. So when you come to mass, it is your wedding when you come up this aisle, you are making your wedding march. And in any Catholic wedding, who's waiting at the altar? First of all, in our faith, who's the groom? Jesus. Who's the bride? The church. Who's the church? Us. So when you come up this aisle, you're making your wedding march. Who's waiting for you at the altar? Your groom. It is the same as a Catholic wedding. You come up this at waiting for you at this altar. I'm holding him. Your groom is waiting for you here at the altar. You come up. The groom is waiting for you. And guess what? And I get letter after letter for this. But I'm going to say it again. I don't care. The church fathers say it. I'm going to say it. It's consummated. And the groom enters into you the bride. Father, I'm scarred for life now. I got letters. Father, I'm scarred for life. You're talking pornographic at the Mass. I am not talking pornographic. What happens at the wedding night? It's beautiful. It's consummated. The groom enters into the bride. You come up as the bride. Jesus is waiting right here. And I place it into you. And the bride literally, or the groom literally enters into you, the bride. It's consummated. And so this is what happens. God bless you. All right. Now, I know I'm running really, really late. But let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to answer this question. This is an actual picture from the shrine. I don't know if you can see it. That's a 12th station. Jesus on the cross. And we're going to answer that question, why did Jesus die on the cross? Okay? All right, everybody. So we're running a little bit late, so let's take a 10-minute break and get back here at just about a little after 8, uh, 7.30. Is that okay? Okay, thank you, everybody. Come back now. Don't be leaving.
take this arrogance that has rendered me blind take this arrogance that has wasted my time my soul cannot rest until i'm resting in you oh my thirst to condemn only robs me of the truth please take away the arrogance lead me back to you Just a game I play to keep from having to hear you say, "Be still, be still." Teach me to sing with the angels a song of praise for your wondrous love. Will I ever be made worthy of your promises? Help me lift my soul to you. And if you see me when I stumble, please rescue me.
Dive into your waters of mercy and rest in your compassionate heart. Will I ever slow the rhythm of my restless ways? Help me lift my soul to you. Help me lift my soul. testing okay everybody let's try to come back and the second half should be shorter uh, the second half should be shorter than the first half so if we could get everybody to come back to the seats okay Okay, everybody. Okay. So thank you so much. The second half should be shorter than the first, so we can still try to get you out. But there is some good things we need to talk about here, because it all ties, and I'm leading up to St. Faustina and Divine Mercy. I had to set the stage for what mercy was, why the Mass has the three great acts of mercy. Now we're going to add to that one part I kept saying, where does it say that we are at Calvary during the Mass? Okay. But you know, before I do, I want to do say one thing. Remember I said a second ago, I forgot to mention something I think is important. I said, what is the definition of evil? Evil is not a real created thing. That would mean God created it. Well, Father, have you read the news? Evil's everywhere. Evil is a lack of something. It's a privation of the good. Evil is a privation of the good, a lack of the good. So when we take God out of our courts, God out of our schools, God is goodness itself. When we take him out, what's left is evil, a lack of the good. And I want to point out one something that I think is fascinating, sadly. What event happened in 1963 that crushed the innocence of the United States? Everybody says John F. Kennedy, and to some sense this is true. Okay, in that same year, we had noticed all these variables. Divorce. Do you know divorce was very low and almost declining until 1963 it skyrocketed? Do you know violent crimes? In 1960, up to 1963, throughout the 40s, 50s, and early 60s, was low, almost declining. Then in 1963, it skyrocketed. Then, unwed pregnancies. Unwed pregnancies were very low. All of a sudden, in 1963, they skyrocketed. And they've been going up. Does anybody know what happened in 1963? Not Roe v. Wade, that was 1973. The Supreme Court took prayer out of schools. And we're wondering why we're in the mess we are when you take God, who is goodness itself, out of society. You take goodness out. You take God out. You take goodness out. What's left is a lack of the good. That is evil. So when we see this, all these politicians, we got to pass more gun laws. We got to have more police in the schools. This is not the answer. The answer is we've got to allow us to pray and foster of the, 
moral base we were found on as a Judeo-Christian uh, country. That's all been taken away. We have to fight for these religious liberties. So now, in the midst of all that brokenness, I said the second great act of mercy is redemption. Jesus came down and redeemed us. I asked, how did he redeem us? He died on the cross. Now, this is where I want to start. I said the whole three great acts of mercy are present at the Mass. One, all of creation is here. Two, Jesus redeemed us and we're present as he's redeeming us. That's what I'm going to explain here now. And then three, the Holy Spirit takes us back to God the Father. Now, why, let's go back to this one because this one is deep. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Okay, because he loves us. True, but he could have loved us from heaven. To forgive our sins. True, but he could have forgiven our sins from heaven. He's God. Why did Jesus die? And all those are true. To open the doors to heaven. True. But he's God. He could have opened the doors from heaven, from within heaven. All those are true. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Okay, we're getting closer. No greater love hath a man than to lay down his life for another. But still, did he have to die? He could have still showed us his love. All of those are true, but we're missing the big one. The penalty for sin is death. It's been this way from the beginning. This is how it's always been. This is why the Jews offered animal sacrifice. Did you ever wonder that? When I was a little kid, like, why are they killing all these poor lambs? Because when you sin or I sin, somebody has to die. The thing is, I deserve to die for my sins, and you deserve to die for your sins. The thing was, is the Jews came up with something called a scapegoat. Do you know that's how the term came about? Scapegoat. The scapegoat is placing your burden on somebody else. So the Jews would take the goat and they would send him out into the desert. And then they would sacrifice it. It was a scapegoat. And so the Jews would animal sacrifice because blood had to be shed when sins happen. So to atone for the sins, they would kill the animals because somebody had to die in their place. Death had to happen. Blood had to be shed to atone for the sin of the people. They didn't kill themselves, but we, we, we technically deserve to be given the death penalty by God because what we have done. Now, this is where I want to go with this today because I think this is incredible. Now, as we said, at every Catholic Mass, we see Jesus on the cross. Now, I always tell the story when I was at Walmart, my first night in North Carolina, this beautiful woman saw me with my big Benedict cross, with Jesus on the cross, and she says, you must be Catholic. <laughs> and I said, what gave it away? <laughs> and she says, my Jesus ain't on that cross no more. My Jesus is risen. What's wrong with you crazy Catholics? Why do you still have Jesus on that cross? Jesus ain't on that cross no more. I love uh, Stephen Ray's answer to that. He says those same non-Catholics, they have the little nativity set, you know, with the animals and the, the statues and the mirror, even though they say you can't have statues. They have their little nativity set. And he says, do you have one at home? And she's like, yeah. He says, do you have the little animal? She says, yeah. And he says, do you have the Joseph and the mirror? She says, yeah. And he says, you have the little baby Jesus in the crib? And she says, yeah. And he says, ma'am, Jesus ain't in that crib no more. <laughs> so they pick, they pick and choose. But the, the point is, we have, we have Christ on the cross at the Mass. Why? Jesus is risen, right? We're not there yet. Jesus is risen and then takes us back to the Father. That's the third act of mercy, sanctification. We're not there yet. We first have to be redeemed. All right? Now, this is what's important. 
at the mass is when it's happening. So Jesus died on the cross because Paul tells us the wage of sin is death. I'm not making this up. Father, where does it say the penalty for sin is death? St. Paul. The wage of sin is death. When you are at Calvary, or excuse me, when you are at the Mass, you are at Calvary. Instead of death, Jesus died for you. And that's what's happening on the cross. He's paying your penalty for death. Instead of death, we just have to share a little bit of that cross. And instead, we're grumble. we grumble. We get mad and we get angry with God. But I take a little sliver of that cross over eternal death. Then we are redeemed. Then we are sanctified and taken back to the Father. Let me tell you a little story that I love that fits this example. I love this picture. Has anybody seen this picture before? Nobody seen this picture? This is an incredible picture. What's happening in this picture? Okay, first of all, who's this guy? Us. Who's this? Okay, this is Satan, right? Now here's the funny thing. What's he accusing this guy of? What is Satan, and this is what's going to happen at your judgment. What is Satan accusing this guy of? Sin. You're half right. Guess what the devil's accusing this guy of? Unconfessed sin. He cannot do this with confessed sin. Once your sin is confessed, Satan cannot do this, even at your judgment. God can, if he feels you haven't atoned for it properly. But this guy cannot. Who in the world wants to be in this position? I know I don't. So get to confession. This is what we don't want. Now, this story is what I want to tell you. I want to explain this further. All right. I want you to picture this. I tell this to my seventh grade catechism class all the time. This is how I get my seventh grade catechism to understand what our Catholic faith is all about. All right. I said, picture, I says, okay, guys, you're old enough to understand this. What happens if you commit a crime? And they all say, you get arrested. Okay. And then I say, what happens after that? They say, you go to jail. Well, you forget something. What happened before going to jail? You go before the judge. Nobody has gone to jail before going before the judge. So I say, okay, guys, you're old enough to know this. Let's talk about this. All of a sudden, you've committed a crime. You've been arrested. Now you go before the judge. And I want you to picture this. You're in their courtroom. The judge is on this high this high pedestal here and you're before the judge by yourself when you are judged you will have nobody with you not your spouse not your kids not your parents you won't have anybody with you you will be by yourself now picture yourself guys you're before the judge and that judge pulls out your rap sheet now with me especially during my college fraternity days, they're going to have to have a truck wheel it in. <laughs> All right? Now, technically, that judge could be flipping through, hmm, hmm, oh, hmm, hmm. Judge finishes, you're getting the death penalty. You have committed the worst possible crime. What is the worst possible crime? A crime against God. What is a crime against God? Sin. Every one of us is in front of that judge and we will be, or we have a right to be told by that judge, you deserve the death penalty. You are going to die. All of a sudden, in through the back of the courtroom, in walks a man You've never met him. You've only seen pictures of him. Long hair, robe, 
sandals. Who's this man? Jesus. And I tell my seventh grade, Jesus is going to come next to you. And he's going to put his arm on you. Look at that picture. He's putting his arm on that kid. And he's going to give you a look of love like you've never seen in your life. And he's going to look up and he's going to say, Your Honor, Father, I will take his place. I will die in his place. Let him go. All of a sudden, this guy, deserving to die, are you, what are you going to do? Are you going to say no? Who in their right mind would say no? Well, here's the thing, everybody. Some people will say, thank you very much. I'm out of here. Thank you, sir. And out the door they go. Here's the point. The point is that father, that judge, is going to say, you are going to take his place. Yes. Jesus says, I'm taking your place. But what do you have to do? The judge looks at you and says, you just don't run out the door and say thank you. The judge is going to ask you, do you accept this gift? Now this is where the Protestants have it right. Yes, I do accept you, Jesus Christ, as my personal Lord and Savior. But we're not done. Remember, after redemption comes sanctification. That's where the Protestants stop. So this judge is going to say to you, do you accept this? And you're going to say, yes, who wouldn't? But then are you done? Are you free to go? Not quite yet. Because that judge is going to turn to you, and he's going to turn to Jesus, your defense attorney, and he's going to say, okay, guys, to work out the details, to, to, to consummate this agreement, we all need to come back here Sunday morning at 8, 10.30, or 1.30? What happens Sunday at 8, 10.30, or 1.30? The Mass! When you come to Mass, you got to be present. It's like any beautiful award. Must be present to win. And the judge is saying, okay, to work out these details, you got to be present. Come back here. Who in their right mind wouldn't say, I'll be there? Oh, you know what? I'm too busy. I got a football game to watch. I got shopping to do. I got a haircut appointment. Seriously? You've got the Redeemer of the universe stepping in to take your place. All you got to do is come on Sunday to receive those graces, and we're, we're too busy. So I see my 7th graders are like, that's what's going on? Yes! That's what's going on. When you come to Mass, Jesus is now paying that penalty for death. I'm sorry, for sin. And what is that penalty for sin? Death. So when you come to the Mass, you are at Calvary, this is why the sanctuary is always built up. Why is the sanctuary always built up? This is the rock. This is Golgotha. This altar is the sacrificial cross by which the sacrifice, which is now bloody or unbloody, represents and is a representation of the bloody sacrifice. When you come to Mass, you are here at Calvary as Christ is paying your debt to sin. Father, that makes no sense. What are you talking about? God is outside of time. God's eternally present before his Father, bearing the wounds of the crucifixion. For God, there is no past. For God, there is no future. It sounds weird. But for God, there's only one big eternal present moment. This is why Jesus told St. Faustina, your prayers helped get me through the agony in the garden. Well, she lived 1,900 years later. And you, at church, 2,000 years later, are here at Calvary as Jesus is paying that debt to sin. And yet we're too busy. 
This is the Mass. The second great act of mercy, redemption. This is why we Catholics have Jesus on the cross. Because we have to be there as he pays that debt so we can accept it. Then he resurrects. Then we're sanctified. And that's when the priest offers it back to God the Father, returning us back to him. You come, you consummate it, and you go home. But do you live it? Do we have any idea what God just did for us? Oh, I'm not into organized religion. Whoa, you're missing a whole heck of a boat. And this is why we have the Mass. All this ties to divine mercy. And so this is what's going on. You know, Jesus took our place. We don't re-crucify Christ. People say, oh, I get these letters all the time. Father, you're a heathen. You're a pagan. You keep re-crucifying Jesus. That's not in the Bible. We don't understand God is outside of time and we're not re-crucifying him. We're there as he's paying the one-time debt for our sin. God is not constrained by space and time. We, when we come into church, we enter into sacred time. Pope Benedict said, it's like the spirit of the liturgy. When you come into Mass, the, the, the mystics tell us the roof of the church opens up and heaven and earth ascends and descends and the angels and the saints unite with us here on earth. Heaven and earth is united only at the Mass. When you are here looking at your watch, yes, that's historical time, but as the Mass is going on, the angels and saints ascend and descend and sacred time takes over. And in sacred time, there is no watch time. You are at Calvary. Jesus is paying this debt for sin. So we do not re-crucify him. We're there for the one crucifixion. And that priest is Christ at the altar. He's in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. This is what's going on in the Mass. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this whole thing becomes a question. And you know, we don't understand the power of what Christ did for us. I don't have a lot of time to explain this part, but I think this is so powerful. Wow. You know, if we have any idea what Christ did for us, we wouldn't do what we do. We would come to Mass. We would, we would, we would engage in the passion. You know, it's funny because if, you know, when you think of what Jesus did, um, I also tell this to my seventh grade kids. Okay, I think this is so powerful. Does anybody know how many people are alive in the world today? Close to 8 billion. It was 7.5, I think it's close to 8 billion now. Does anybody know how many people have lived? Science has a pretty good idea of this. How many people have lived since the beginning of time? Any ideas? 115 billion people. 8 billion alive today, 115 billion have lived since the beginning of time. You know what I personally think? This is not church teaching. This is Father Chris, my speculation. And it's in line with church teaching. If each and every one of us really had to die for our sins, let's suppose a truck pulled up right now. We got a couple hundred people here, and they put up a couple hundred crosses outside. And every one of us was nailed to that cross to pay the penalty of debt for our sins. All right? As I'm being nailed to the cross, I would feel only my pain. I mean, emotionally, I might be sorry, and you might be sorry for me and whatnot, but physically, you would only feel the pain of the nail going into your wrists. And by the way, was Jesus nailed in the hands or the wrists? Ah! They have really good scientific evidence now. You know what the answer is? Both. The nail went into Jesus' palm at an angle to go through the certain bone and exited out his wrist. So it was fastened to the cross on the wrist, but went in the hand. This is why when you see in the divine mercy image, Jesus' hands like this, the, the wounds are in the palm, but when you see the shroud of Turin and his hands are like this, they're in the wrists. Jesus was, was nailed in the palm, but it went in at an angle and came out the wrist. Now, if every one of us was nailed, nailed to the cross out there, and what do they have here? Oh, they have them on the wrist there. There's no official church teaching on this, but that's what science is telling us. Interesting. Now, 
Here's the point. If every one of us was nailed to the cross, you would feel the pain for yourself. You would feel the pain for you. You would feel the pain for you. But you wouldn't physically feel his pain or her pain. I believe that if the world ended tonight and 115 billion people have ever lived, did Jesus redeem all of humanity? Yes. yes. But will all of humanity be saved? No. I believe Jesus... When that nail, let's say put Jesus died tonight, and you know how many people, this is a tradition with a small t. The church small tree tradition says the world will end when the number of human souls goes to heaven that replaces the number of angels that fell with Satan. There are billions of angels, way more angels than mankind. And so tradition is the world will end when the number of human souls enters heaven to replace the exact number of angels that fell from the sky that day. That's not dogma, but that's church tradition, small t. Now, I believe, let's suppose the, the world ends after 200 people, 200 billion have lived. I personally believe if the world ends when 200 billion people have lived, that when that nail was nailed into Jesus' wrists or his palms and his feet, I believe he did not feel that pain just for himself. I believe that Jesus felt that pain 115 billion times more than you or I would. Can you even imagine? Because he died for you, 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 and me. So he's going to feel the pain of death for you, 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 and me. That's why Jesus says, meditate on my passion. That's what he said to do in the three o'clock hour that we're going to talk about tomorrow. That's why it's the hour of mercy. Isn't that amazing? That's incredible. And so we have to look at this. And now we have the rest of the story. Because what I want to finish with tonight is set up St. Faustina for tomorrow. Tomorrow's all going to be about divine mercy and St. Faustina, but I had to set the stage today. What? Okay. Now, yes, God's mercy is most seen in the Mass, but it goes way back before the Mass. God's divine mercy goes back to Adam and Eve. All right? Adam and Eve goes back to the very beginning of time. Do you know one of my seventh graders told me something they just discovered? I had no idea. And he caught me off guard. He said, Father, did you hear about the new writings? Is something similar to the Dead Sea Scrolls? And it talked about Adam and Eve. I said, no. He said, you didn't hear this? He says, it's on the news. I said, I really don't get a chance to watch the news anymore. And he said, Father, it's in the news that there's a documented case of, of, the, of the story of Adam and Eve. I said, really? He said, yeah, Adam and Eve, after they were removed from the garden, they had their children, you know, and Cain and Abel were walking with Adam now they were kicked out of the garden, so they had to, what, till the ground? They had to sweat by the brow, their, you know, the sweat earn, earn a living by the sweat of their brow. And supposedly this kid said from the documents that Adam was walking with Cain and Abel, and Abel looked into the garden where they were kicked out of, and he said, Dad, did we used to really live in there? And Adam said, yes, son, we did. He said, Dad, look at it. It's incredible. It's gorgeous. It's perfect. Dad, we really were in there? He says, yes, son, we were in there. He said, Dad, what happened? Why did we get kicked out? And I'm like hanging on every word. I'm like, what did it say? And the kid goes, Adam answered, your mother ate us out of house and home. <laughs> I was schlickered by a seventh grader. But... That's hilarious. I, I, I love that story. So anyway, and by the way, do you know that we can trace back science? <clears throat> do you know every one of us, they can genetically trace back, every single living human being can be traced back to one woman? Did you know that? Every living human being can be traced back to one woman. So the question people have with the Bible is, do we read the Bible literally? Do we read the Bible as literally true? Yes or no? I hear a lot of no's. Actually, the answer is yes. We read the Bible as literally true. 
Now go home tonight and cut off your right hand. Because <laughs> it says if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Okay, the meaning of the word literally, what that means is not the way we use it in English. The word literally means what the author is trying to tell you is true. Okay, so if I tell you I have a thousand things to do tomorrow, am I lying? <laughs> Actually, no. But if you were to follow me around with a paper and pen and say, okay, Father Chris, check, 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 you would not get to a thousand things. So I don't technically have a thousand things to do, but it's true. The meaning I'm trying to convey is I'm swamped. So the meaning of the authors of the Bible is, is yes, if something in your life is causing you to sin, you got to get rid of it. That's literally true. Now they speak in hyperbole. We don't read the Bible as literal lists, meaning we actually get a saw and cut off our hand. So we got to realize how we read the Bible. Now, in the Bible, we start with Adam and Eve. And this is where I want to finish tonight. Because what was the problem with Adam and Eve? What did they do? Everybody says they sinned. Actually, that's not the problem of Adam and Eve so much. It's what they did afterwards, or what they didn't do. Here's the problem. The problem was not so much Adam and Eve sinned. It's what they did afterwards. First of all, did Adam and Eve, after they sinned, did they say they were sorry? Did they ask for God's mercy and forgiveness? No. Second, were they, were they merciful to each other? No. I always laugh. Adam, there's a real man. God looks down and says, what happened? And Adam's like, whoa, it's the woman you gave me. It's her fault. I mean, they weren't merciful to each other. And finally, did they trust in God? No. What did they do? They ran and they hid. So the whole point to this is Adam and Eve wasn't so much they sinned that got them into trouble. What happened next is what got them into trouble. Adam and Eve did not know their ABCs. A, ask for God's mercy. B, be merciful to each other. And C, completely trust in God's mercy. This is going to be the pivot point of everything we talk about tomorrow. But I want to set the stage tonight. This is the message of divine mercy. This is the heart of the gospel. Pope Benedict said the message of divine mercy is the heart of the gospel. You want to know the heart of the gospel? You can summarize it in these three things. Ask for God's mercy, be merciful to each other, and completely trust in God's mercy. Pope Benedict said this message of divine mercy is the nucleus of the gospel. It's not optional. All right? If you want to get to heaven, you need all three of these. If you don't have any one of these three, you cannot get to heaven. If you want to get to heaven, you got to ask for God's mercy. You got to be merciful to each other and you got to completely trust in God's mercy. What do I mean by that? Let's just basically do a couple slides here. A Ask for God's mercy. Jesus says, I cannot punish even the greatest sinner if he makes an appeal to my compassion. But on the contrary, I justify him in my unfathomable and inscrutable mercy from the diary of St. Faustina. A, you got to ask for mercy. It's not optional. In the Bible, it says if you do not repent and ask for forgiveness and mercy, you can't enter the kingdom of God. All right, next. B, be merciful to each other. What's this? The Good Samaritan. We must be merciful to each other. What does Matthew 25 tell us? Anybody know Matthew 25? Oh, Catholics, come on. <laughs> Take out your Bibles. Oh, you're right, you're Catholics, you don't have your Bibles. So you can get them on our table. Okay, so what's Matthew 25? The sheep and the goats. At the end of time, he separates the sheep from the goats. To the sheep on his right, he says, well done. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. Well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome into the kingdom of your father. Sorry, goats. On his left, he will say, when I was hungry, no food. Thirsty, no drink. Naked, no clothes. And when I was in prison, you didn't visit me. He says, away with you. But he doesn't stop there. He says, into the eternal fire. Does that sound optional? No. You must be merciful to each other. And, and this is important. Because Jesus says in the diary 742, I demand from you deeds of mercy. You are to show mercy to your neighbors always and everywhere. You must not shrink from this or try to excuse or absolve yourself from it. This does not sound optional to me. 
<laughs> he says, he says, I demand. Does that sound optional? You must not shrink from this. Even if the strongest faith is of no avail without works. And this is what our Protestant brothers chew us to pieces. Even though Matthew, I'm sorry, James 2.24 says faith without works is dead. Do you know the only place that faith alone appears in the Bible? This is the biggest misconception. Our non-Catholic Protestant brothers say it's faith alone. There's only one place faith alone appears in the Bible, and that's James 2.24, which says you're not saved by faith alone, but by works. Now, we're not talking about works like working in a soup kitchen. We're talking about works of love from the heart, all right, uh, or writing a check. All right, I am giving you three ways of exercising mercy to your neighbor, deed, word, and prayer. So even if you can't do something nice because you're bedridden, you can pray for somebody. All right, so I don't have time here because we're running out of time. But these are the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. All right, corporal works, feed the hungry, drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, pr visit prisoners, comfort the sick, bury the dead. But more important are the spiritual works. Teach the ignorant, pray for the living and dead. Ah, admonish the sinner. Boy, that's the one we priests really get uh, commemorated for. When we try to correct the sinner, we're all called bigots and haters. Listen, nobody's judging the person. You love the sinner, you hate the sin. We cannot promote a lifestyle that's contrary to the will of God. You know, I said this morning in the homily, I said, I think my next book is going to be Catholicism. Why we must be intolerant and judgmental. That'll sell a million, won't it? But it's true. It's a work of mercy. Not intolerant of the person, not judgmental of the person, but the act. I had a woman once come up to me and says, Father, I, 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 gotta, I gotta talk to you because I'm so judgmental. I've sinned, I've sinned, Father, I've sinned. I said, what, what happened? She says, my daughter came to me and said, Mom, you have to drive me to the abortion clinic and pay for my abortion. And the mom said, I just can't. And the daughter won't talk to her now. Now the mom came running to me to say, I've sinned, I've done something horrible. No. You can't condone that. Does that mean you stop loving her? No, it doesn't. Does it mean that you condemn her to hell? You're going to hell. No, it doesn't. It means we can't accept that action. Honey, I love you too much. I can't do this. Because I love you. It's like a child playing in the road. You're not going to say, well, you know, I can't get Junior out of the road. He's having a good time. <laughs> you whisk Junior out of the road. You get him out of harm's way. God loves me the way I am. How dare you judge me? Yes, God loves you exactly the way you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. He wants us constantly growing in virtue. So these are the works that you can do that. Love the sinner, hate the sin. All right, finally, C, completely trust in God's mercy. The graces of my mercy are drawn by means of one vessel only, and that is trust. The more a soul trusts, the more it will receive. You want to know what this one is in a nutshell? All right, here it is. You want to get to heaven? I want to get to heaven. We wouldn't be here if we didn't want to get to heaven. The only way that you can get to heaven is grace. That's the only way. God's grace. No check writing out, no nothing, even though we need works of love. That's cooperating with his grace. And Jesus said, trust is the vessel by which all grace is received. So in other words, you want to get to heaven, you need trust. How do you get trust? Lord, I'm sorry. Jesus said that in order to get to heaven, we need grace. Okay, Lord, give me grace. But then Jesus said you need a vessel to catch that grace. That vessel is trust. You have to trust. And trust is simply accepting the help someone gives you. And what is the major help Jesus gives us? The church. The Blessed Mother. Obedience to the church is obedience to God. Not in stupid things, but in church teaching. All right, now, we don't get to heaven without grace, and we don't get grace without trust. Trust is the vessel. All right, so we need all three of these to get to heaven. All right? Finishing up, last two slides. Now, you want to summarize the whole Bible in one slide? The whole Bible, one slide. The Bible is a love story. 
It starts with a wedding and it ends with a wedding. What wedding does the Bible start with? Adam and Eve. What wedding does the Bible end with? The book of Revelation. I just described it earlier in this talk. Second, the great commandments can be summarized into one. Love God, love your neighbor is basically do the will of God. Father, how do I do the will of God? Simple. You live the ABCs. You ask for God's mercy, you be merciful to each other, you completely trust. This was the whole diary of St. Faustina. And tomorrow night, please come back because we're going to unpack that entire diary. Love is what this is all about. The Mass is a wedding. And love is not an emotion, even if you're falling asleep at church. I go into the chapel at night, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I want to go home, but I'm there because I make a decision. Love is not an emotion. People get divorced because my emotions are now down. Well, emotions go like this. If you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're gonna take love, you have to understand it's a decision, it's a commitment. Does any parent feel like changing a dirty diaper at two o'clock in the morning? No, you do it because you love the child. You made a decision. And a wedding, it's the same thing. I make a decision to love you. God comes and proposes to you in the Mass, and you're going to say yes or no. Now, we have a commitment. And so the commitment is do the will of God through living the ABCs. Trust His will, not our will. All right, so finally, St. Faustina... Jesus got so many priests and prophets, and I'm sorry, uh, prophets and mystics to tell the world about this message of mercy. He rose up great saints and prophets saying, teach the world my mercy. It sounds simple, right? And they did. All these great saints and prophets brought this message of mercy to the world. A, B, C, ask for God's mercy, be merciful, completely trust. God brought it, but we didn't listen. We didn't listen. And since then, God has been trying to bring this message to the world. We aren't getting it. Finally, Jesus says, that's it. I'm done. I'm done. Now, he never used those exact words. But that's in essence what he meant when he said, You, <laughs> you, St. Faustina, will prepare the world for my final coming. In essence, that's what Jesus said. He rose up one of the greatest saints of our time and says, you will prepare the world for my coming, my final coming. A spark will come from Poland to prepare the world for my final coming. And that spark is not Justina. That spark is Saint Faustina. She's working in Faustina's footsteps. That's beautiful. So this spark will come from Poland. So tomorrow night, we're going to start with this simple little nun. This is her convent in Wadgivniki, near Krakow. She was a simple nun, living a simple life. God doesn't pick who you would expect. Moses stuttered. Mary was poor. You know who St. Paul was? St. Paul, this great man who changed the church. Nobody other than Jesus and Mary and Joseph really had the impact, maybe John the Baptist, of St. Paul. St. Paul is the reason we have a church. You know who St. Paul is? Don't you see statues of him in Rome? That big hulking figure with lightning bolts coming out of his hands and holding the scriptures. You know who St. Paul was? St. Paul was ball headed, bow legged, hook nosed, and four foot eight. That was St. Paul. We know that from the Apocryphal Gospels. And so God doesn't use who you would expect. St. Faustina, John Paul II said, was nobody from nowhere. And God used her to change the world. And tomorrow night, we're going to talk all about what she brought to the world. The feast, the image, the novena, the chaplet, and the hour of mercy. All that is tomorrow. And don't miss it, even if you have to watch it on live stream, because we're going to tell you what you got to do to get the graces of Divine Mercy Sunday. All of that is tomorrow. I'm sorry I had to set the stage for it. So tonight, if you got to go, I'm sorry. I know I ran uh, 15 minutes late. But you got to go, head for the doors. But I ask Father permission, if you'd like to stay We'll have two lines for my communion line, and I'll give you a personal blessing with the first class relic of St. Faustina. And tomorrow night at the end, we're going to do a Eucharistic healing service. And with Father's permission, I'll take the Eucharist around to each one of you and give you a blessing with the most blessed sacrament. 
So tomorrow night, uh, come. We'll do the healing with the Blessed Sacrament. Tonight, if you can stay, I'll give you a blessing with the first class relic of St. Faustina. Now, in the meantime, we invite you, and again, if you have to go, you got to go. But I want to finish by showing a one-minute clip of who St. Faustina is. And on your way out, we got some things that if you want to grab, um, one is my book, Understanding Divine Mercy. All these proceeds pay for our seminarians. We have more seminarians today than we've ever had in our history. So we want to have the guys come forward who were um, going to do a collection. If they can start the collection, if you can, if you can't, God bless you, that's okay. God, God will put on your heart. If you're able to help us, please do. Um, we're trying to build a new monastery because we've run out of rooms. We've literally run out of rooms. So many young guys are coming to want to be Marian priests, and we've run out of rooms. So these guys are going to come forward. They're going to uh, do a quick collection. If you can't, please, no judgment. you got to feed your family. you got to pay your bills. You're out of work. I'm praying for you. Don't worry about it. Just pray for us. Okay, so we're going to do a quick collection. We're going to show you a one-minute video. And finally, everybody, if you, somebody was asking if we had this talk on DVD, we do have the talk on DVD. If you'd like to get it, it's out on the table. And then after the blessing of the first-class relic with St. Faustina, I will personally sign books. So if you would like one of these books signed, I will give it to you. Uh, also, if you can't afford it, let me know, and I will pay for it for you. So if you can't afford a book or a DVD, but you really will watch it, I will get it for you, okay? That's what we want to do. That's how God has blessed us, and we want to help you. So basically, this is what tomorrow will be about. And um, also, too, if you experience any depression or anxiety in your life, this book says after suicide, but suicide's just the story. If you have any depression, loss of a loved one, tragedy in your life, Please get this book for anybody who's suffering. This book explains why we have, I'm sorry, I should hold it, <laughs> why a good and loving God would allow such suffering. And so it's not just about suicide. So let's finish tonight with a one minute video about St. Faustina, who we'll talk about tomorrow. Assured of what she must do, Faustina left for Warsaw at once. There she was rejected at every convent door except one the Congregation of the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy, a religious order dedicated to helping prostitutes reform their lives. After Faustina entered the Sisters of Mercy, her superior, in her notes, assessed the new novice as no one special, and put Faustina to work to pay for her religious clothing. She was a simple, uneducated nun, with just three grades of elementary schooling. She rarely left the convent and performed the most mundane tasks. Her life appeared so ordinary on the outside. She was busy working and spent part of her time in the chapel. Every day she met the same people. Her day had the same rhythm. So on the outside, she led a dull, humdrum existence. Beneath her perceived dull existence, Faustina's deep inner life overflowed with extraordinary mystical graces, divine revelations, and heavenly visitations. Christ began appearing frequently to her in visions, sometimes as the King of Mercy, resplendent in light and majesty. At other times, he appeared as the tortured, crucified Christ. At the request of her spiritual director, Faustina began privately to record these mystical experiences in a diary. Okay, that is where we're going to leave it off to everybody tonight. Tomorrow we're going to talk about the diary of St. Faustina. We're going to talk about the feast, how you get the graces, the image, the meaning of that painting, the novena, the chaplet, and the hour of mercy. And believe it or not, it's actually less content than tonight. <laughs> The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless everybody. Father, did you Thank have you a... so much, Father. Thank you. God bless you. Thank God you for bless you. Time. God Thank bless you, you God so bless much. You. Thank you. Did you... And, and so please come back tomorrow evening, 6.30. We'll be here and we'll get started. We're, we're so happy that Father Chris is with us. Uh, 
You're free to leave. If you want to get the blessing, please do so. Come and form like communion, and he will give you the blessing. Uh, and if you're not going to receive the blessing, that's fine. But uh, this is a place of prayer, so let's, uh, let's keep it reverent as we leave. Thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow night.